All right, I think we're going to get started here. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the kickoff of our 2020 Animal Law Weeks. Uh, this year we had so many great ideas and people interested in speaking that we decided to expand our Animal Law Week to, uh, to two full weeks. Um, and so this is the fifth, actually. Uh, or actually, no, sorry, this is the sixth uh, annual Animal Law Week. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'll give you a quick rundown of other events that we have coming up the rest of the week. Tomorrow we have Professor Rajesh Reddy from Lewis and Clark. Uh, on Wednesday, we have Nicole Negawetti, our clinical instructor at the Animal Law and Policy Clinic, speaking with Deepti Kulkarni about clean meat issues. Uh, on Thursday, we have Ashta Sharma Pokharel, who will be speaking about uh, defending dissent. And on Friday, we have uh, Harvard professor Christine Korsgaard from the philosophy department, who will be talking about her new book, uh, Praise of Fellow Creatures. Um, so for today's talk, we have Professor Kristen Still, and I'd first like to thank the, both the Animal Law Society and the Middle Eastern Law Students Association for helping co-sponsor today's event. Um, but Professor Still is a professor of law at Harvard Law School. She also serves as the faculty director of the Animal Law and Policy Program and the director on, of the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World. So she is very perfectly positioned to speak about the issues she's talking about today. Uh, she's also a deputy dean of the law school. Um, she was named a Carnegie Scholar for her work on constitutional Islam, and in 2013, she was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. She also, in, um, she has her PhD from Harvard in uh, History and Middle Eastern Studies, and she did most of her research in Cairo, where she saw the condition and the plight of animals there and became very much involved, and she still runs a, a side charity that, that collects funds and sends them to some of the shelters there. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to her. Today she'll be right. speaking of Islamic conceptions of animal rights. Right. Please join me in welcoming thank Professor you. Kristen oh, Still. Okay. okay, so thank you very much, the Animal Law Society, for starting off these two exciting weeks, um, and for you being here to talk about this really interesting topic. So my first involvement with animal issues in the Muslim world was in Egypt, as Chris mentioned, back when I was a graduate student conducting dissertation research in the country, and I looked for an animal protection organization where I could volunteer. The animal issues there are really front and center in the streets every day, feral dogs and cats, abandoned pets, horses, donkeys, camels, pulling heavy loads, or carrying tourists around the pyramids. If you care about animals at all, you notice. It's not hidden behind uh, closed doors as it may be uh, in other places. So I looked for a group, a group I could volunteer with, and I found none. But I met a woman who was in the early stages of starting a shelter and an advocacy organization, and she was calling it the Society for the Protection of Animal Rights in Egypt. And the name really struck me, rights? Um, it's the same word used in human rights, and in, at that time, I didn't even know of a US-based organization that used the term rights uh, in its title, or at least it wasn't commonly used. And I also thought about, given how poor the situation was in the country for the animals, even to get some basic protections would be challenging, and rights seemed a lifetime away. But Amina was not thinking, uh, Amina Baza, the founder, was not thinking in incremental terms, nor was she burdened by the fact that animal rights had a certain connotation in, in the US that was seemed as very ambitious or aggressive, uh, for example. Instead, she was drawing upon the many publications in Arabic that were literally called Animal Rights in Islam, or Animal Rights in Islamic Law. They were, these publications were published in Egypt, in neighboring countries, and they were quite you know, confident in calling for, or uh, talking about animal rights in Islam, or Islamic Law. And she was drawing upon what she understood to be general concepts that animals have rights in Islamic Law. But what does that mean, and what did it mean, given the social context in which clearly Animals had no rights at all, and society was struggling to provide basic rights to humans. So this talk will focus on the question, what are Islamic conceptions of animal rights? It will show that Islamic law does recognize that animals have interests, but the interest is not uniform for all animals or all contexts. In some cases, the interest looks something like a right, while in others, the interest looks much more like one of welfare. But contemporary advocates, and I'm going to end with one, can draw upon these, this legal tradition to advance the cause of, Islam, of, of animal rights. But in doing so, they're going to need to deploy some creative methodologies to prompt the rethinking of established positions. So what I'll do quickly is get us on the same page in terms of what is a definition of animal rights. I'll do a quick overview of Islamic law and history. 
And I'll show that there's a lot of recognition for the protection of animals, but the most significant issue from a rights perspective is that animals are considered permissible to consume. Uh, third, I'll turn to how modern advocates, uh, rights advocates specifically, are using the tradition that I'll have just said something about. They're taking stronger positions now and advocating for things that really wouldn't have been possible even a short time ago. I'll focus on an author, scholar, activist who wrote in the 1980s, and then I'll, write, I'll focus on a young female activist who is known today through Facebook. And then finally, I'll kind of, kind of quickly place the animal rights movement in the broader context of what we might call progressive uh, movements in, animal, in Islamic law today. So just quickly on animal rights, as we get on the same page, as we all know, animal rights does not have one meaning. And it can be used in many different contexts, in academic writing and in public discourse. It can be used in a very broad sense to mean any improvement in the way that non-human animals are, are treated, what we would properly call welfare. Our own Cass Sunstein has argued that animals do have rights because we have anti-cruelty laws. And some people would say, well, that's not really a right. That's just some kind of protection in the, in the criminal law. People who take a stronger view of rights would say something like, Animal rights means that animals have rights that cannot be violated for the benefit of others. And so in today's talk, I'm going to take this stronger view on rights, a more absolutist view on rights, to explore what we can find in the Islamic legal tradition. And I want to do that because there's been a lot more conversation about animal welfare in Islamic law, and as we'll see, the tradition is rich with that. But can we really extract something that looks more like animal rights, protection of rights, that cannot be violated for the benefit of others. OK, so very quickly, for those of you, those of you who don't have this background, um, Islam emerged in the Arabian Peninsula in the early 7th century. At a time, in terms of context, animals were valuable, and camels were in particular were used for transportation. Animals were killed and consumed on occasions, but by no means was there a luxury for that. As you can imagine, the Arabian Peninsula uh, being desert, it was not a place where there were tremendous amounts of, of animals available for consumption. So Muhammad is believed by Muslims to be the messenger of God. He revealed God's message over many years. That message is known today as the Quran. And he also became the leader of a new community that he created. So in addition to the word of God, some things that the prophet did or said were also considered to have a normative value and became the second source of law. So we have the Quran on one hand, and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And so these two textual sources, what do they say about animal rights? Well, the Quranic verses on animals say a lot about killing animals for food and how you should do that, um, but not a lot on really general, general treatment or general principles. But we wouldn't necessarily expect that from the Quran because it's, it's just it's one book, it's not voluminous. And it's not where a lot of our details on Islamic law come from. A lot of them come from the sayings of the Prophet, the normative statements uh, that the Prophet made during his life, lifetime. But the Quran does say a few things, so I want to cover those. So when animal advocates look for a verse from the Quran that has the strongest message on animals, this is usually the one that they quote. There is not an animal in the earth, nor a flying creature flying on two wings, but they are peoples like you. We have neglected nothing in the book of our decrees, referring to the Quran, than unto their Lord that will be gathered. So you're thinking, okay, well that sounds positive, but it doesn't give us much detail. It doesn't use the word rights. It doesn't say what those rights may contain. Absolutely, the Quran's not going to give us a lot when we talk about animal rights, but it does have some important verses. And then the next one I'll mention um, has been drawn upon to prevent the mutilation or harming more generally of animals, and it refers to actions of the devil. And I will mislead them, and I will arouse in them sinful desires, and I will command them so they will slip the ears of cattle, and I will command them so they will change the creation of God. And whoever takes Satan as an ally instead of God has certainly sustained a clear loss. So again, not a lot to go on, but some suggestion that it would be a bad thing to slit the ears of cattle. All right, so let's move on to the statements of the prophet. That's where we get a lot more that we might be able to draw on for some theories of animal rights. Now, I can't say too much about this, but I want to say that 
Whereas the Quran is considered authentic in its, in its entirety, there's no question uh, in the tradition that these were the words of God. The sayings of the Prophet have a little less sense of certainty because many were collected long after his death. And it's not always clear that every single one has been transmitted down through the generations with the same sense of certainty as the other ones. So you may get a great one, but it may not be a home run because there may be some doubts about its authenticity. So just keep that in the background. I'm showing you ones from collections that have kind of the highest standards of authentication. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of these, and I'm going to ask you, if you had to make a rights-based argument, how would you use this saying of the prophet? So the first one, we were traveling with the prophet, and he stepped off to the side to attend to his needs, when we saw a small bird with her two babies, and we took them. The mother bird came over and began fluttering in the direction of the prophet. So he said, who made her miserable by taking her two babies? We turned them to her. All right, so what do you think? If you had to use that to make a rights-based argument, could you provide an interpretation that might support it? What do you think? Yeah. So I think you could say there is a recognition that the mother bird owns or controls her children mm -hmm. um, from that, that she has some sort of family or property rights. Okay, so um, the idea that there's some right of bodily integrity and bodily liberty, and that it's the mother who decides, right, not humans, to use them for their own purposes. Some kind of right of bodily integrity. Any other thoughts on this one? There's a couple, so you don't have to thought on every one, but anyone else want to say how they might use this to come up with something strong? Yeah. Really? Well, there's a recognition that she the bird has some sort of emotion that we connect to a human emotion of being miserable and upset. Yeah, who made her miserable by giving her two babies. Some sense that there's a, a, a cognizance that this was a harm. Okay, great. Take a look at this one. An ant bit the prophet and ordered that the ant colony be burned. God spoke to him and said, because of an ant's bite, you have burnt a community that glorifies me. <coughs> you think? How can you interpret that? If you were to record it, please. Sorry, I didn't warn you, Chris, that I was going to take some suggestions. Can you use that to make a strong statement? For, 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 for rights, the idea that under no circumstances should the animals be harmed? What would you make of it? Andy has the comment down here and someone in the back, too. <coughs> Well, you notice the connection, the almost anthropomorphization of ants as glorifying mm -hmm. uh, God, and then secondly, the um, <clears throat> it almost implies like a direct right not to be killed, even for lowly ants. Quote unquote, so it would be uh, probably uh, translated up the so-called food chain. Yeah. So one ant, one ant. Right, and then it turns into the complete destruction of an ant colony. Was there someone else who wanted to add something? Um, Sorry, Chris. <laughs> How would you use this to make a, a rights-based argument? So <clears throat> the fact that the ants, perhaps just by their being, glorifies God as part of God's creation um, <clears throat> could imply that it would be that they have a right to continue to exist uh, and that a kind of wrathful or just willy-nilly destruction is itself an offense even though they are just ants. So some kind of right to life. So we've seen sort of right to bodily liberty, right to bodily integrity with the bird. Here are some kind of right to life, a notice, a notification that the community of ants has some kind of spiritual value or, or benefits God in some way. Okay, this one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. We can come back to the, in the question and answer. This is about giving water to, uh, to a dog. But let's look at these for a second. Um, now we get a little bit into the slaughter one, so I'm kind of hinting at what's going to come. Every animal, every human being who kills a sparrow or any larger animal for no legitimate reason will be held accountable for it on the day of judgment. 
And the prophet said that a legitimate reason is to kill it for food, not to discard it after severing its head. What do you think about that? Can you make a rights argument here? <coughs> what kind of arguments can you pull out of this one? What strikes you about this one? Any thoughts? Yeah. Please, please, please. Sorry. Sorry. I think similarly, it, it indicates some sort of a right to life, uh, at least in the first part. Um, and in the second part, I think, while less obvious, the idea that you shouldn't be wasting any part of the creature, I think, sort of acknowledges that there's some value in it, and that by taking the life, you might as well use all of it that you can, which is sort of like a backwards rights argument, but I think it's, it's there. But you see how we start to slip away a little bit from the stronger arguments we were able, able to make about bodily liberty, bodily integrity, right to life? Now we're getting the sense that maybe there's reasons that you shouldn't take the life of an animal, but we have a strong statement about food here. Okay, great. So let me say something about um, pulling all these together and, and what the legal scholars did, and then I'll turn our attention to some contemporary advocates. So the scholars took all these sources and came up with legal doctrine. And so one point they came to agree upon is that causing animals suffering and harm is wrong. And they didn't dispute the point that you can use animals for transportation, for food, for wool, but they didn't see these kinds of uses as per se harmful. We're talking about the traditional scholars, and I'll get to the contemporary period in just a minute. But just to lay the groundwork, the owner could do something wrongful, um, uh, the, the owner was not able to do something wrongful, but could act within the permissible boundaries. And that is very much, as you're probably thinking, an animal welfare approach, right? You have ownership, you can do certain things, you can make use of their, uh, of their labor, but you can't, go up, you can't go beyond that. And so these wrongful acts would include things like overloading a pack animal, or mutilating an animal, or things that would cause unnecessary harm. Interestingly, when these wrongful acts did happen, the traditional scholars didn't talk about them in terms of a right of an animal violated, but usually it was a wrong against God. So God's the creator of the animal, God holds the right. This isn't an obstacle to animal rights necessarily, but it's something that the contemporary advocates are going to have to deal with. How do we lodge the right, the ability to enforce any right that exists in the animal um, itself? Now, killing for food is much more complicated, as you saw here. Um, many of these traditional scholars saw it just perfectly natural that animals would be killed for food, and they didn't really think about it any further, other than the fact that well, you can't be uh, excessively cruel in the process. And I actually, uh, and for some though, they, did, they wanted to develop a theory of, well, why is it okay to kill an animal for food when you have all these other strong statements that seem to suggest some kind of right to life? And so they thought about that. And I don't think they were thinking about a potential wrong as the pain of slaughter, because I don't think they saw it as painful. Rather, they were really wrestling with the question of, is taking the life of an animal a wrongful, a wrongful act? Or how can we accept the fact that we can kill animals for food when deprivation of a life at the same time seems to be problematic, like with the ant hadith? And so for some of these scholars, they developed the idea that God would compensate these animals in the hereafter for their suffering. That their role on the earth was to provide food for, food for humans, and any deprivation of their life, well, if it was a wrong, that would be compensated by God, uh, by God <coughs> later. And so that is a bit of a challenge for developing a rights approach that includes farmed animals, but we will see more about that um, in just a minute. All right, so now I'm going to talk about using all this tradition by some contemporary advocates. Uh, and I'm going to focus on two different kinds of individuals. The first one is the author of these two books. Uh, he uh, was the imam of a mosque in England. He was a trained Islamic scholar. The second one I'll get to in a few minutes. Her name is Farah. She's a Muslim, and she's an activist uh, on Facebook through a group called Anonymous for the Voiceless. So let's talk about what uh, Al-Hafiz Bashir Ahmed Masri was able to do with the traditional sources. 
So his 1987 book, Islamic Concern for Animals, it's sort of part scholarship, part sermon, part advocacy. And he's really furious about two things in particular. And that's scientific testing on animals and factory farms. Now, I think it's really interesting that this is around the same time we're getting attention to these same two issues uh, in secular contexts due to Peter Singer's focus on them in his book, Animal Liberation. And so in terms of testing and research, he's very categorical. He says that there's a total prohibition against cutting or injuring live animals, except especially when it results in suffering, and that applies to, to vivisection, that all life is sacrosanct, and that we should have, him, his Muslim community, should basically have the same standards for humans as for animals. If you wouldn't test on a human in a certain way, then don't test on an animal. But he really directs the strongest language at factory farming. And he goes into great detail about what we all know now, but it's really remarkable that in 1987, he's talking about the tethering of veal calves, like the treatment of dairy cows, um, all the kinds of things that, that we know about, the runoff from concentrated animal feeding operations. He's getting all of these uh, at that time. As for the slaughter of animals for food, though, El Masri says, look, Islamic law permits it, and what we really need to focus on is the welfare of the animals in the, in the food system. He cites many of the sayings of the prophet uh, that are concerned with animals' well-being at slaughter, such as the state say, when you must kill a living thing, do it in the best manner. When you slaughter an animal, use the best method. Sharpen your knife, <clears throat> cause as little harm as possible. So he has this interesting balance of some really strong rights-based statements, but at the same time, a more welfare approach when it comes to the killing of animals. So he published this extended version in 1989, this Animal Welfare in Islam. It retained the first book, but it added many new chapters, all dealing with animal consumption. And he really has a much stronger position here. He's, he goes on to say, Islamic law does allow the killing of animals, but he goes on to advocate for a vegetarian diet, which is a very interesting position for a traditionally trained Islamic scholar to take. Um, but after all this advocacy for vegetarianism and the economic harms, economic unsustainability of meat eating and the environmental harms, he concludes with the statement of, well, Islam has left the choice to the, to the, in the individual to be a vegetarian or what he calls a meatitarian. So he marshals all this evidence and says, but you choose. So why did he not go further than just saying it's your choice? Well, perhaps he didn't believe anything stronger than that. Maybe he thought that it's really up to humans to decide if you want to engage in you know, uh, harm to the environment, to animals, etc. But perhaps there was a doctrinal reason. Perhaps there was something in his studies as an Islamic scholar that kept him from saying that. And so I want to show you a Quranic verse that's often brought up in any conversation about abstention from meat eating. Believers, do not prescribe the good things that God made permissible for you. The idea is that if something is permissible, if God made something permissible, humans should not deem it prohibited. Not just you choose or, you know, maybe it's not the best idea, but prohibited. So Masri might have been going as far as he thought he could when he said, look, it's really bad for all these reasons, but I leave the choice up to you. All right, so that's his view. Now I want to turn to a very contemporary actor, a young activist named Farah. Yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, but just to okay, hold on one second, please. One second. Can you can you uh, this is very interesting to me. Um, just for context, um, do you know what the, the uh, I don't know the Arabic word, the ayats that come before or after. Oh, this good question. Citation. Yeah, because this is also quoted in other contexts. Yes, well, that's not just at all. Exactly, and so that is part of the issue: is that in, in Islamic legal interpretation, there's a question of do you try to confine 
any injunction to the specific context, or does it become a more general principle? So I will say, though, just as an empirical matter, this has become a more general principle, which I think, as you said, is quoted in many different contexts, right? Um, but perhaps it can be narrowed. And so you'll see what Farah is going to try to, try to do here. She's also going to try to combat it with other things. And then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up at the end. So I want to show you a, um, a video from Farah, celebrities activist, which she posted on Facebook. I don't know a lot about her, but I can feel pretty certain she's not trained in classical, traditional Islamic legal studies. Um, and I like that very much, and I'll say why later. Uh, but just to, to preview it, it's because I think change is probably not going to come from the guardians of tradition. It's difficult to wade into these arguments without firm grounding, but I think also the kinds of things she's saying is going to you know, potentially be the, 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 the view of the future, and perhaps you have to be unburdened by a grounding in tradition to say the things that she's going to say. And then we'll talk about what... What are the downfalls by saying things without perhaps knowing all the traditional arguments behind them? So let's just watch her for about six minutes, and then we'll talk about what she says. Salam. Ana ismi Farah, wa ana min jamaiya alamiya isma anonymous for the voices. Min kam yam nizel video ala Facebook ala safha isma Sawrit al Mahroumin la shakhs ismo Ahmed Bakish an yihka anna. Isma an shual. انه ما بيعرفوا كيف بدهم يهاجموا الاسلام، اليوم بشارع الحمراء شوية مهابيل يعترضون على ذبح الاضاحي باعتباره تعذيبا للحيوان. يا حيوانات حركتكم دماء البقر التي خلقها الله واحلها للانسان ولم تحرككم دماء الاطفال المبزقة والاجساد المحترقة في سوريا؟ الم اغضبكم الذبح الحلال ولم يغضبكم قتل السيران في اسبانيا للمتعه والتسليه ولله في خلقه شؤون. يعني هذا اليوم بشارع الحمراء. بس بدي اقول وين المجارئ المراجع الدينيه ترد عليهم. الكل عم يتطور على الاسلام. يوم صار ذبح البقر حرام. وقتل الاطفال بسوريا حلال. مصارعه السيران وقتلهم وتعذيبهم في اسبانيا حلال. وذبحهم على الطريقة الإسلامية حرام هلا أنا كنت من اللي واقفين بشارع الحمراء وأول شيء بحب وضحه إنه نحن ولا بأي طريقة ضد الدين لأنه أنا ما بسمح لها شيء يصير وأكيد أنا ما كنت شاركت بهيك شيء أصلاً ثانياً نحن عم نتظاهر ضد قتل الحيوانات وضد التعذيب يلي بتعرضوا له كل الحيوانات البريئة وين ما كانوا لأنه صحيح إنه الله حل الأكل الحيوانات بس كلمة حلال مش يعني فرد يعني مسموح فقط أما الفرد يلي هو علينا فهو عدم أذية النفس في فتوى بتقول كل ما يثبت بأنه ضار بصحة الإنسان فهو حرام وهيدا الشيء ضروري لأنه أجسامنا ما هي أمانة من عند الله وبوقتنا هلأ أكل الحيوانات ومنتجاتها هي سبب كل الأمراض المنتشرة بعالمنا العربي وأثبتت الدراسات أنه أكل الحيوانات هي أهو منتجاتها هي أكبر مسرطن والسبب الرئيسي لأمراض القلب والضغط والسكري وكل هيدول عمر بن الخطاب قال إياكم واللحم فإن له ضراوة كضراوة الخمر وعلي بن أبي طالب قال لا تجعلوا بطونكم مقابر حيوانات وأكيد الصحابة بيعرفوا بالدين أكثر, أكثر منا وهن حذروا من أكل اللحمة قبل ما يصير ما كان عندهم يعني الاكل النباتي المتوفر عندنا هلا بعدين ليكون الاكل حلال لازم تطبق عليه تطبق شروط الحلال على الحيوان من اول ما يخلق ليصير وقت الذبح مش بس فتره الذبح فاذا الحيوان تعذب بحياته ليوصل لهالوقت فهو بطل حلال من قبل ما حتى يندبح بعض الأحيان عم يندبح الحيوان هو بعده كثير صغير ونحن بنعرف إنه هذا الشيء أبدا مش حلال. وكمان بوقتنا هلا ما عم تتطبق الشروط الحلال بالمسالخ أبدا. وأنت لازم تطلع عن قضية الذبح بالعيد، لأنه الذبح بالع... الذبح بالعيد مش فرض بالدين. الفرض بالدين هو إنه الواحد يوزع خيراته على الناس. أما الذبح بالعيد فهو قصة عادات مش أكثر. وكمان انفرض علينا انه نحن ما نأذي الارض يلي نحن عليها، انكتب لازم عمارة الارض، 
بس هلا اكل الحيوانات ومنتجاتها هي السبب الرئيسي بنقص المي بالعالم نقص الموارد سبب تغير المناخ وكل هالاخبار هلا اهم شيء انا بدي اوصل له وبدي اوضحه انه هي قضيه الانسان انا عندي سؤال اذا انا اكلت هلا حيوان بريء كيف بكون عم ساعد الاولاد اللي عم يموتوا بسوريا هيدول موضوعين ما خصنا ببعض واذا نحن طرحنا موضوع معين مش يعني عم نبرر موضوع ثاني ابدا واذا انت شايف انه في موضوع مهم لازم ينطرح اطرحه انت ونزال على الشارع واحتج مثل ما نحن نزلنا على الشارع واحتجينا وكل واحد بيطرح مواضيعه وما بنتهجم على بعض وهيك بيصير التطور الفكري واذا انت عن جد مهتم بامور البشر لازم تعرف انه صارت المنتجات الحيوانيه هي السبب الرئيسي بظاهره المجاعات وموت الاطفال من الجوع بالعالم كل هالحبوب والاكل بالكميات الهيله اللي عم نحن عم نعطيها للحيوانات كرمال تنصح بشكل اسرع اسرع من الطبيعي ليش ما بنطعميها للاولاد اللي عم يموتوا من الجوع بالمجاعات اخر شيء انا بحب اوصل له بحب احكي عنه انه الدين نبهنا انه زمن بيتغير وركب علينا نحن المسؤوليه انه نواكب عصرنا لانه بتختلف المعطيات والشبهات والرسول قال انتم اعلم بامور زمانكم والدين نبه عن المفسدين بالارض وبوقتنا هيدا مصايب اللحم والضرر على الحيوان وعلى جسمنا وعلى الارض وكل هدول كله بخالف الدين والله عمل الانسان خليفه في الارض ومع هيدا الشيء بيجي مسؤولية انه نحن نفكر ونحن نعمل الشيء الصح والشيء يلي هو بيتوافق مع ديننا شكرا وسلام Um, for what she's trying to do and the issues that she's trying to take on. So, what is she doing here? Okay. So, look at how she approaches the issue of meat. She recognizes it's permissible, but she does so much more than Mashri did in his books. Right? She goes far beyond that. She doesn't say you decide, she's actually saying it's wrong, right? that it's obligatory to abstain from meat. Now, she doesn't use the language of animal rights, although I suspect that she would agree with that concept, right? The voices are the voices, the anonymous for the voiceless, those are the, uh, the animals that she's referring to. So I think she would go along with the framing of animal rights, but you know, as I said before, it's hard to, a little bit hard to get there uh, in the farmed animal context with some of the textual sources. So, she instead, instead of engaging with all the slaughter sources and the permissible sources for slaughter, she kind of takes a more modernist move and she appeals to these more general principles, like it's obligatory to avoid what harms you, which is completely true. But that's what she's trying to get you with, not to engage in the permissibility of slaughter and the kindness of slaughter hadith, but this more broader principle. And then she explains why meat consumption is harmful. So if it's harmful, it's obligatory to avoid what harms you. Um, she says, in a religious, a religious agreement says that you know, everything that has proved to harm a person is haram or impermissible. And she cites to authorities other than the prophet. So you notice she's not citing the prophet. She's citing the prophet's political successors. And those are even more, more controversial to rely on and more, less authoritative. But she's going with what she's got. Right? She's pulling out all the sources she has. And then she makes a larger argument about the need for Islamic law to change with the times. Um, the prophet saying you're more knowledgeable of issues in your times. And she's employing some really some key tactics uh, in people who are working in contemporary issues in Islamic law to try to push them forward. And it's important that she's making them, but to really develop, fully develop her theory of what I'll call rights would involve you know, much, uh, a much more uh, careful and thoughtful study on all the textual sources and how they might be able to kind of go up against some of the other sources that, of course, she's not citing, but the ones that we looked at together. So let me just quickly conclude and then take your question. So where does this lead this in terms of animal rights? So I want to place this in the context 
of other movements for change because I think that animal advocates can learn a lot from other movements, and particularly what I would call sort of the feminist scholars, or the pro pro progressive feminist movement within Islamic law, Islamic law, because these issues don't progress on their own, right? You need advocates to push them forward. So what, are, what have been some of the moves that progressives have made, or Islamic feminists? Well, one is to appeal to more general principles, such as public good or public welfare, which is really well known that the public good should be served, the public welfare should be, should be met. But public welfare or the public good is often used to make the final decision between two interpretations of a source or between conflicting sources. As a sort of free-floating tool, all on its own, its own independent argument, that's, that use is less common and it's more controversial, but potentially could be very powerful, and that's exactly what she's doing. She's using kind of free-floating general principles. And then another tactic that we've seen um, feminist scholars use is to go back to the original sources for which maybe meanings have seemed clear for generations or hundreds of years. And to say, well, wait a minute, maybe the meaning isn't all that clear. Maybe the male scholars who derived these rules brought their own biases to the text. And when they read them, they saw something because their cultural outlook of their time led them to that direction. But why don't we today go back and look at them with a fresh view and say maybe there's something different that we could conclude about this verse of the Quran or this saying of the prophet. And so in this case, it's almost a bigger challenge because did humans read sources in a way to privilege themselves? I mean, I think we all probably would all agree that that is true. So to develop a really robust theory of Islamic animal rights would require scholars uh, with prompted by activists like her to go back and look at these sources and say, was the human privileging here so strong that it led us to one direction and other directions are foreclosed? Can we go back and recover alternative views? And indeed, we've seen other examples where things can change. Slavery was not required in the Quran, but it was seen, it was, it was, it was recognized as taking place maybe with a, a sense that it wasn't a good thing, but it was not abolished, right? But now it is. Now, virtually every Islamic scholar will say, slavery has no place on this earth now. Like, it just, it can't, it can't happen today. Polygamy, for example, was, has been abolished in some countries, controversially so, controversially so perhaps, whereas the, whereas the Quran might allow it, might not allow it, it's not clear, but its permissibility was well established in the doctrine. <coughs> So this leads to the final point I want to make today, which is that in this entire conversation, I've been talking about religious law, right? Uh, not national law. I haven't mentioned Egyptian law. I haven't mentioned Saudi Arabian law. Although these arguments could be quite influential in these countries, perhaps Saudi more so than others, or Iran more than others. Um, but Islamic legal arguments should be cultivated because they can have an influence on national law, but also how people behave. She's trying to convince her, you know, her, her Muslim uh, colleagues not to eat meat for the reasons she's going, going to tell you. She's not thinking that Lebanon is going to abolish meat eating tomorrow, but her arguments could be persuasive on an individual level. So in many ways, to advance these rights-based arguments, there needs to be two tracks, maybe one on the national level and one on the individual, individual level. So her arguments, though, could affect personal behavior, and they might also help to develop more structural arguments that can get at the systems that produce the, the issues that she's complaining about. All right, so let me stop there and see what kinds of questions you have. If you just raise your hand, please wait for the microphone, because we're recording. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. My name is Shaheen Bilzad. I'm a resident of Cambridge. Um, she said, as I read correctly, that uh, uh, sacrifice of animal on Eid al Adha is not uh, mandatory. I think it is mandatory because uh, when we go for the pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia, we have to sacrifice an animal each person has to, and the entire meat is wasted. So I was wondering what's your say on that? Well, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, I think there's strong arguments that it's not mandatory to, to slaughter any animal. Maybe it's recommended, maybe there's a, uh, but there's no, 
I think there's strong arguments that there's no ob obligation to slaughter an animal on, on Eid al-Adha. In fact, uh, something I'm covering in my own research, there's a strong movement to encourage people to do other acts of charity instead. Give money to the poor, build a water fountain outside your house. So there is a small, but I feel fairly strong sentiment that there are other ways that one can serve the poor on this particular um, holiday. But in Saudi, as you know, now it's a coupon system, right? And, and so the wasted meat problem, the problem used to be that if every pilgrim wanted to slaughter an animal, but they couldn't consume it all in the few days they were in the country, it would get wasted. And that was a well-documented problem of waste. So now there's a coupon system, and interestingly, you can purchase a coupon towards the slaughter of an animal, and then the meat, you could get some of it, but a lot of it is, is frozen and sent to countries like Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, you know, other countries all around the world uh, to consume. So it doesn't mean that consumption is down, it just means that waste, waste is down. One often hears in Muslim countries the notion of rights. God of man. I can't say in my experience I've ever heard a phrase about the rights of animals in Arabic. But there is an alternative that may grow out of some of these cultures that might be worth thinking about. There was a case from North Africa, I think it's in the book by Toledano, of a man who is found guilty of having had sex with a donkey. I do not remember what the punishment for the man was, but I do remember that he was required to give the donkey several bales of hay for the assault on her dignity. And I think the word may have been ara, which is usually translated as honor. So I'm wondering, and I don't mean to sound like Justice Kennedy, if there is a concept of dignity not of rights, that is more elaborated in some Islamic thought, if you've encountered it, whether popularly or in the literature, and whether thinking not in terms of a Western concept of rights, but a possibly more indigenous concept of dignity might be an alternative base on which to build some of your thinking. Well, so first of all, I'm presenting these scholars and these activists, right? I'm kind of giving you a sense of what's going on within, this, within these communities and who's saying what. So you can go to Hollis right now and look up Hokuka Haiwan. You'll find volumes of animal rights. That's the word used for, for human rights, animal rights, Hokuka Haiwan. You'll find books written with that title. That's not the issue. The question is, what, what is a right? And so as I mentioned at the beginning, some of these scholars who will write books called Animal Rights will really be talking about what we might call welfare. And so if we want to build a really true rights approach, we, these are the kinds of issues that are going to be challenging, the ones that I've been talking about. The most common word is rifq, uh, rifq al-haywan, or kindness to animals. Uh, that is even a more common term. And that I would translate more in the welfare uh, category. So that's, you know, there's plenty of references to that in terms of books that are writing today. So I want to just really emphatically say, and this goes back to my first comment about Amina Abadza, no one is imposing a rights-based dialogue on this tradition. The rights-based dialogue is within this tradition, right? It's coming from, with, from within. Those words have been, are, are used and are being talked about. So, I don't feel like we have to avoid it because it seems like it's Western to the contrary. It's as, as authentic as anything that I think we could possibly, possibly find. And unfortunately, sometimes I think the fact that we associate animal rights with the West really does a big disservice to activists in these communities who are trying to say, you know, no, no, we're not imitating the West, they're imitating us. And there's books that have been written about that too where people are complaining like, why do people keep talking to us about the West, you know, uh, attention to animal welfare if we could only follow that? Like, they should read our own books and see we've been talking about this for a long time. Now, talking about it and having an intellectual tradition, of course, is different from facts on the ground. And Egypt is not a wealthy country. It's very hot. There's trash on the streets. That is just a recipe for, you know, for feral dogs, feral cats, so not to look like um, there's a lot of attention. But I'm talking about sort of the intellectual tradition and the arguments that could be made that might gain traction. So it's a longer answer than I wanted to give. 
But other questions? Can, can you mention something about the kindness language being inserted in the Egyptian constitution? Well, because of um, the work of Amina and others, uh, the state's obligation to provide for Rifki Hayawan or animal welfare was, was added into the, um, to the most recent Egyptian constitution. Now, again, what that's going to mean in practice is a different story, but part of the arguments made were that it's coming from within the Islamic tradition and that it's, it's you know, directly from the sources and it's not anything that's coming from the West or imposed by, by the outside. Other questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Someone has a question. What do you think is the source of the biggest pushback uh, on this? Uh, have, have industrialized agriculture sort of seen this as a, uh, a ground that they want to sort of fight on, or is it coming more from scholarly folks, or what do you think the pushback is? I don't know that's pushback. I think it's more of getting these ideas off, off the ground right? and making these kinds of arguments and persuading, you know, persuading people that there is something inherent about the tradition that could serve as the basis, um, the basis for a right. So I think it's more about how can a movement get started and gain traction. I mean, the, the movements are there. There's no question about that. But as, you know, as we're familiar with in, in this country, the animal welfare movements have historically been focused on companion animals, for example, um, and not factory farming uh, or farm animals or animal consumption. That's, you know, that is a bit of a newer issue, and it's a, it's a one that hits people harder, and it's harder, it's harder to, to, to adjust behavior in that, in that regard. So I think it's a matter of getting things moving and getting these arguments out there and you know, having a real debate in the public sphere about them. Any questions? Um, yeah, thank you for this. Um, I was wondering, you know, given that the activists that was in the video were citing Islamic scholars that are coming further along the line, I was wondering if, you know, as there's a division to Sunni and Shiite if there's been, you know, a difference in traditions and whether one's line of Islamic scholarship kind of delved into this more or whether what the difference is. Yeah, no, it's a great question because um, her comment, quoting Ali, uh, the, prophet's, um, the prophet's son-in-law, and the, the considered the, the founder, not himself, but later traced back to him the founding of Shiism, so quoting his sayings in non-Shia circles is not going to be necessarily as per persuasive. But you know the other problem uh, with an activist relying on sources is that she's pulling them wherever she can find them, but she's not necessarily looking at the context. So someone who wanted to confront her on that, because she cites Ali for saying, don't make um, graveyards of your stomachs. Don't make of your stomachs animal graveyards. So you might think, oh my gosh, that must mean you shouldn't eat meat. Well, the, the context, context of it is that Ali's being praised for, um, for his behavior in life and for many things, um, including not eating a lot of meat. But not eating no meat, but for not eating a lot, a lot of meat. So that's, that quote may not do her as much work as she'd like, but it's, it's good that it's there. Right. She has that to go on, but it won't be persuasive in all contexts. So I was waiting for someone to ask me that question, so thank you. I'm glad you did. But that's, that's the point. She's pulling from whatever she can, right? Any kind of argument that she can make. Thank you very much for this talk. I was wondering if you could, if you looked to or thought about any examples of Muslim animal activists in the West who bring some of these principles mm -hmm. into their activism or try and marry some of the concepts of Western animal welfare or animal rights approaches with um, these tenets or, or ideas from Islam. Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, it's definitely the case that there are really strong, strong voices. Uh, in many, you know, many places there is a, um, a vegan Muslim initi initiative, but it's based in Canada and Australia, for example. There's um, 
a very active Canadian uh, who asked people during Ramadan, when the month of fasting, like not to eat meat at night, but to give the money instead that you would spend on meat to charity. Uh, so I think there's quite quite a lot of that. There's an Islamic college in California that now has a, has a whole sustainability uh, program that is not advocating for no meat consumption, but it's very aware of the environmental impacts. And so there's a lot of conversation around that. There's also a lot of conversations around uh, Islamic environmental ethics. And while that's probably been maybe a longer and deeper conversation, which really interestingly parallels what goes on here as well. Like We've had an environmental law program. Environmental law has been taught for how many years in American law schools, right, where animal law is newer. There's a very strong environmental ethics tradition, um, contemporary in the drawing upon Islamic art, arguments of stewardship, uh, for example, of the earth. So you can definitely find, find those, um, those arguments being developed outside of, of Muslim-majority countries. In, in fact, it's a little harder to see them sometimes in the, in the Muslim majority countries. The context may not be as open to these kinds of these kinds of dis discussions. In Lebanon, you could go out in the street and protest like that, and you know, cr critique the slaughter uh, holiday Eid al-Adha, but you can't do that in Saudi Arabia, for example, just due to the the, 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 the political nature uh, of the regime. Even in Egypt, I'll say. The, the activists that I worked with uh, who were doing companion animal work, cats and dogs, uh, sheltering horses at the pyramids, okay, that was all fine. But when they started talking about uh, animal agriculture and what they were questioning was, you notice the word halal, which is the kind of Islamic seal of approval for meat uh, and other items, just kind of a, a parallel to kosher. They started questioning whether the central Cairo slaughterhouses was producing halal meat because of the, the very severe violence that was going on in there. Well, they got a call from you know, national security right away. Like, what, wait a minute, you can't talk about that. Like, it's fine for you to do your cat and dog stuff, but like, you can't talk about this. So food security, these are really serious issues, and I think they're much harder um, for, for people to engage in. And then there's a long tradition of, of meat eating. The, the, the strongest sheltering activists I work with are like, I know I probably should be more attentive to farm animals, but it's been in my tradition and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to cut back. So these issues are more entrenched as they are really everywhere in the world. Well, I think we're actually just about out of time. Okay, so, that's great. Um, All right. But yeah, please join me in thanking Professor Thank Chris you. for taking off our panel on and, um, Please join us in the same room tomorrow noon for Rajesh Reddy speaking about animal protection issues in India. Thank you so much.